In the most gray and uninspiring of contexts, that of burgeoning EU bureaucracy, our next guest has managed to amass a highlight reel, second to none, turning his European parliamentary position into a bully pulpit for a growing movement of Eurosceptics. Take a look. You are all in denial. By any objective measure, the euro is a failure. Just who the hell do you think you people are? You are very, very dangerous people indeed. Your obsession with creating this euro state means that you're happy to destroy democracy. So what are you saying? That this isn't quite as bad as the USSR? I had totally underestimated the complete fanaticism, Mr Barroso, of you, your College of Commissioners and the European Central Bank. Yes, it'll mean you lose your job, Mr Barroso, but apart from that, apart from that, why can't we do things as mature democracies? Yes, I want you sacked, Mr Schultz, as well. I want you all fired. You have the charisma of a damp rag and the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. And the question that I want to ask, the question that I want to ask, that we're all going to ask, is who are you? <laughs> Well, now everyone knows who he is because that video went viral, and everyone knows who Nigel Farage is, leader of the UK Independence Party, member of European Parliament. These speeches over the years have gone viral on the internet, and Mr. Farage has garnered a following not only at home, but here in the US. While at home, his party has gone from fringe to a force to be reckoned with. Nigel Farage joins me now live. We're so thrilled to have you in I'm studio. Thanks for being here. Pleased to be here, and thank you for sharing my best clip. We we really did like your highlight reel. So much to choose from, hard to get it whittled down. <laughs> so let's just start with you. You, every time you give a speech on the floor of parliament, when you come on this show and do an interview, it goes viral in the financial blogosphere here in the US. Why do you think your message resonates so much here in America? Well, the global markets are all interconnected. You know, what happens particularly in New York and Chicago is, is totally linked in mm -hmm. to what is happening in the Eurozone. And the Eurozone crisis is hanging heavily across the whole of the financial and investment community of the world. So people are really interested to hear what's going on. Um, and what they get from Mr. Barroso and Van Rompuy and all the other ghastly people in Brussels that no one's ever voted for, what they get is this diet of, there's no problem, chaps, we're going to have a summit next Thursday, it'll all be sorted out. Well, there have been 21 summits yeah. over the last two years, and here we are today with Cyprus on the verge of needing a bailout, um, the Spanish position, uh, frankly, looking perilous. Um, and I think the reason my stuff goes viral is that I'm giving not just a counter-argument, but I think and I believe and I hope a pragmatic economic alternative. Well, and kind of what you're getting at is there's a bull market for, for truth. There's a bull market for getting past the BS and the rhetoric. What I found interesting was even on the mainstream networks in the U.S., you've been on CNBC and Fox yeah. this week, I feel that you were more well-received there than, than maybe you would be by Mr. Barroso and by some of the, oh, the press that. in Europe. Oh, yeah. So, I, I mean, it's even into the mainstream in the U.S. You think this is, do you agree, first of all? Well, I think look, anybody that looks at economics from a fundamental perspective is going to say this Eurozone should never have been put together uh, the way that it has been, and that, <laughs> frankly, and that, frankly, it can't last. Mm -hmm. The only question is how long will the agony go on for? And my worry, um, as you showed in that last clip of mine, right. uh, my worry is that the political will to keep this thing propped up is, is so fanatical mm -hmm. um, that it could be many, many years, it could be up to a decade that this crisis goes on. A decade, goes, one I, decade before, yeah. before what we see an exit? Well, I said, well, no, I think other exits will happen first, but the reality is that the whole European project was put together as part of a Franco-German pact. It was done with honourable intentions, namely to stop war, but it misunderstood that people don't want to be given a new identity and that you should never create a state without consent. Uh, but here we are, and no one's noticed. We've all watched Greece versus Germany, Spain versus Germany, and we've talked about the gap in, co in, you know, in competitiveness terms that has grown mm -hmm. between yeah. them. What yeah. no one's noticed in the last two years is that gap between France and Germany is getting wider. We've now got a new French president uh, whose views on economics, frankly, are mad because the first three things that he does on becoming president, he reduces the retirement age 
from 62 to 60. He ups the minimum wage by more than the rate of inflation, and then he introduces a hate tax yeah, 75% of 75%. Tax. Yeah, and a he says, if there, if there were any entrepreneurs mm -hmm. left in Paris, please catch the next Eurostar out. And because of that, I think this gap between France and Germany will get bigger. And the awful reality for the people that wanted to build a European state is I don't think in the end even France and Germany can survive together in same aside economic and monetary union. Oh wow okay well that's bold but let's back up a little bit because have even you been surprised that we haven't seen a Greek exit yet or that despite all of the pain we've still seen Greeks go to the polls and yes uh, give more support to anti-euro parties but ultimately re-elect mainstream parties and that the euro architects despite the cost of these bailouts still seem committed to keeping Greece in. Have you been surprised yes, at I have. on this long? I, I, I have to say that I would have thought that by now the markets would have forced Greece out. Um, and it hasn't happened. Um, and I think Draghi's statement that we saw over the summer, the, the ECB president, when he said, we will do whatever, whatever it takes. It takes. Um, and kind of they mean it. I mean they are prepared to risk everything and more to defend this project. The clue was a meeting that I had last year with Angela Merkel. And I said to her Chancellor, wouldn't it be kinder to your taxpayers, who've just spent 20 years paying for Eastern Germany to be reintegrated into Western Germany, wouldn't it be kinder to them to stop having to sign a blank cheque in perpetuity? And wouldn't it be a liberation for Greece to leave the euro, get the drachma back with a, a big devaluation and an opportunity to trade their way back to, to, to some sort of sanity? Well, what um, did she say? She said, no, Mr Farage, if Greece leaves the euro, other countries will leave too. Mm. And that will be the end of our European dream. So you think it's the, fear, the right. fear of the dominoes? But you just, it's absolutely, that was what she was saying. But what she's also really saying is this, we don't care. We don't care that youth unemployment is nearly 60%. We don't care that 25% of private companies have gone bust in the last five years. We frankly don't care if the whole of Greece starves, mm. as long as we maintain our Euro project. And that is why I think uh, these people running Europe are bad people, I think they're dangerous people, um, and we saw a specimen, I think, mm -hmm. um, in, in Athens yesterday of the future. If you take away from people their ability to vote to change their futures, they will turn nasty. But they did vote for their futures, and they re-elected mainstream parties. Well, actually, there wasn't a single opposition party. Well, no, no, Syriza, no. Syriza were arguing about the terms of the bailouts, but they were not saying Greece should leave the euro. Nobody was saying Greece should leave the euro. It's as if the political class in Greece and in Spain and in Portugal are like rabbits in the headlights of an oncoming car. No one's got the self-confidence or the courage. So you think everybody's terrified of the alternative yes, uh, to, to sticking with these measures? I, I, I think if somebody comes along, mm -hmm. if a serious business figure in Greece was to come along and say, look, this will be painful, but hey, it's painful anyway. Right. We may suffer inflation, it may be difficult for the first year or two, but actually the only hope we've got mm -hmm. is that we get our currency back, we're able to become much more competitive again. I think once that leadership is given, mm -hmm. the people would follow, but at the moment, it's absent. Okay, and what of, if this does continue, we just saw a report from the IMF coming out saying that if policymakers aren't able to fulfill all of their promises yeah. that they have given, that banks will have to deleverage, if, it, if you can even call it a deleveraging, because they've gotten bailed out thus far. Four and a half trillion dollars in assets. Yeah. Uh, at this point, uh, what is the, are the consequences of that kind of deleveraging, and who's left to bail the banks out well, with, with the well, core becoming well, more you. and more weak? The IMF. The because IMF. The IMF, the IMF, which had done a good job since 1945, has now been hijacked. You know, it may be here in Washington, but effectively, it's become the overseas bailout office for the euro. Uh, and if things go badly wrong, uh, the IMF will be expected to put huge amounts of money in. And that, of course, includes America. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think there should be a bigger debate in America about, you know, should they still be putting 18% of this money into the euro bailouts via the IMF? So, I mean, I'm pretty unimpressed with all the IMF does. Well, and it's interesting because that might be a discussion in Washington, but I don't think you'll ever see a mainstream news report. Oh, everybody in the U.S. needs to worry about the money that the government's giving to the IMF. I'm wondering if you have been surprised, because you've been here all week, is there a lack of knowledge of the nuances of Europe amongst people in the U.S., would you say? Yeah, I think. I mean, I... I've met, um, over the last couple of days, you know, some people that are very senior, very knowledgeable people. Um, who kind of sort of think 
that the European Union is just some sort of free trade agreement. Um, <laughs> that, that, no, but really... If it just was, uh, there and, wouldn't and, be and, these and okay, problems. You in Britain, you're not in the Euro, so what's the problem? And, and there is a lack of understanding that uh, the European Court of Justice um, is supreme over our own courts and our own countries, that even in the case of Britain, which is outside the Euro, 75% of our laws are made somewhere else. Mm. Um, there is incomprehension when you tell them that the Parliament has got three homes and it travels around like a circus mm -hmm. um, and that the budget hasn't been signed off by the auditors for the last 17 years in a row. I think there is, uh, through much of the American media, not much knowledge mm -hmm. about what's really going on over there. Do you think that's dangerous given the magnitude of Europe's problems? Right I now, think the it's crisis. changing, and I'll tell you why. Because when I when I meet the, fina the financial community over here, they do know what's going on. Because they've got money at stake. <laughs> they know what's going yeah. on, and I think events like yesterday, when a German chancellor—I mean, Germany is a big, important country—when a German chancellor turns up in Athens to be met by people wearing swastikas and giving Nazi salutes, I think the media say, "Goodness me." What on earth is happening here? So I think things are changing. Yeah, it is when you see the Molotov cocktails or the yeah. protests that the U.S. media pays attention, despite yeah. so much more of import going on. You know, I have to ask, you give these colorful speeches on the floor, you do not mince your words. Is the relationship with the other uh, EU members of parliament and, and bureaucrats, is it as it would appear to be, given Stop. how you are on the floor in private? Or do you go, are you chumming with Van Rompuy and you go have a beer at the pub it's after being fined thousands of euros for uh, It's not good. <laughs> no, not good? it's not good at all. No beers no. with Van Rompuy? Absolutely not. And I wouldn't want to have a drink with him, frankly. I, it, it's not that I disagree with these people. You know, I mean, I know people, you know, from the left of politics, and I might be more free market, and those guys you can talk to, disagree with, have a beer with, no problem. These people, it isn't that I disagree, they're bad people. These people, you mean the, the I mean the people leading Brussels. the European project, and Barroso and Van Rompuy are at the top. They are out to destroy democracy, which you is really something that was so important that those that went before us actually went to war to defend the very principle of democracy and these people want to crush it. These people have got this fanatical belief in their project, in their flag and in building a new state. Well, it isn't going to work. And if they keep the whip hand for too long, I fear there'll be outbreaks of violence all over the Mediterranean. And we may see more uh, damp rag comments. You may be paying more fines, Mr. Well, I, Farage. Well, it, it, it's, it's been calculated mm. uh, that if I am rude to Mr. Van Rompuy, and if I'm fined another 63 million times, I personally would have paid for the entire Euro bailout fund. Oh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> we are going to keep you here. We're going to come back after break. More with Nigel Farage in just a minute. Welcome back. We're talking to Nigel Farage today. And at home in the UK, his party, UKIP, has been gaining steam in 2009 elections. They were polling with double su the support of the stage in the prior electoral process that they had. And just last month, this is a headline from The Guardian. No exaggeration. UKIP is now a force to reckon with. If the cards fall its way, Nigel Farage's party will shape the 2015 election and politics of Britain and Europe for a generation. So uh, let's bring our guest back in and talk to him about this growth in support. So, Mr. Farage, what do you attribute that growth in support to? Is it mostly the Eurosceptic message or is it mostly the UKIP domestic policy? platform that, that people I, are in support of. I think of. on the Eurosceptic message, uh, to a large extent, people say, well, UKIP have been proved him right. You know, even people that don't like me, you know, UKIP have been right about what they've said. Okay. Okay. Um, and that this topic um, about democracy, about self-government, uh, which really the mainstream media and parties tried to bury under the carpet, you know, let, let's mm -hmm. not discuss it in front of the children, that unavoidably has now rocketed up the agenda of politics in the United Kingdom. Uh, but it's not just that. I think in the early days, UKIP was necessarily a protest party against what was happening in the European Union. Mm -hmm. And we used to talk about who governs Britain. We're now talking about how that Britain should be governed. Mm -hmm. So we're now saying, once we're free of it, once we've cut the Gordian knot mm -hmm. of being in the EU, we will be able to liberalise our labour markets. We will be, you know, all these things we're able to do with the money um, and with the ability to have our own trade deals across the rest of the world, which we're currently forbidden from doing. So I think that the reason people are coming to us isn't just any one simple thing. It's a big, broad agenda that is attractive to people. Yeah. That's one reason. Okay. The second reason is that for most of UKIP's existence, we used to draw our support from across the spectrum. Patriotic old Labour, classical liberals, conservatives, all sorts of people would vote for us. But for 13 years, the Tory party were in opposition, which is almost the entire lifetime of UKIP. Okay. And people used to say, well, look, Nigel, we agree with you, old boy, absolutely marvellous, but 
we've got to vote Tory, we want to get Labour out, mm -hmm. and David Cameron's playing a very clever game. Mm -hmm. Just you wait till David gets in, they used to say. Okay. You'll see, well, David is in, uh -huh. and they've seen, and he's broken promises mm -hmm. on giving a referendum. He's done nothing to halt mass immigration into Britain. He hasn't dared address the issue of human rights. Mm -hmm. So there is a big disenchantment, I think, and people see Cameron, frankly, as indistinguishable from Clegg and Miliband in terms of policy. Okay. It's interesting. There's a similar conversation in the U.S. where you have uh, presidents from both parties that end up carrying out very much the yeah. same platform, yeah. similar policies. Do you think... Uh, a politician like Ron Paul would be the most comparable in the U.S. to you or, or kind of his li yeah, more libertarian stance? I think, I think that, that, that Ron Paul's campaign over years mm -hmm. um, to campaign for, in a democracy, we want personal liberty right. and the responsibility that goes with that. Right. And we want a smaller state and we don't want Washington in control of absolutely everything. I think there are some strong similarities. Right. Yeah. And that said, I heard you recently say that the U.S., you would think there would be more of a conversation about the debt in this country. And I, I would agree with you. I, I completely agree with you. Yeah. We talk about it all the time. It seems that other issues have become more pressing and more of the, the national uh, psyche and then the mainstream media. I'm wondering uh, if you think that the day of reckoning is being delayed by problems on the other side of the Atlantic or the Federal Reserve's policies well, and well, how long it can continue. Well, continue. I mean, just as what's been happening with the Eurozone crisis with the last 21 summits yeah. is they continue to kick the can down the road. The same is happening to a large extent in America. Uh, with your massive, massive annual deficit. Mm -hmm. um, nobody's really addressing this. I know that Romney, um, in that debate, did begin uh, to talk about this, but frankly, uh, your public finances are no better <laughs> than the rest Absolutely. of the Eurozones. Um, and, and, and the extent to which national debt is growing year on year on year is something very serious. I mean, frankly, what Western governments are doing at the moment is they're stealing money from their grandchildren. Oh, absolutely, for the taxation down yeah. the line to pay for spending today. So when do you think the day of reckoning does come in the U.S.? Because the Fed has shown that it has a willingness to buy bonds. Yeah. What it can't control is faith in the dollar in foreign exchange markets. No, that's true. That's true. I, I, I don't think the day of reckoning has come. Yeah. Um, I'm pleased that Romney did well in that debate the other week, uh, but I would like to see him be much more assertive. I'd like to see Romney say, look, you know, Barack's a nice chap. Uh, but he's proved he's not really up to the job. I have been successful in business. I've gone out there, I've done it, I've made tough decisions, I've run a company, I'm the man you need to run this economy. And let me tell you, America, it's going to be rough. It's going to be tough. There are going to have to be some very big cutbacks in the size of a state. Um, but if you follow me, and we go on this course, we'll get this ship steady again. We'll, we'll see if he would even be able to follow through on that. What he's but proposing he's now it. isn't even a, a plan that would do that. And in defense spending, he wants to increase. I'm curious, we've heard warmongering from Romney uh, towards Iran. In general, I think some would say that the U.S. has been saber-rattling about war in Iran. What do you think the reaction would be among financial and political elites in Europe if there was a war with Iran led by well, the U.S. I think people would be very, very worried. I mean, look, Iran is a big country. Yeah. Um, we, have, we are now a decade, over a decade, into a war in Afghanistan. Yeah. And let's be honest, we're achieving nothing. Oh, I couldn't agree more. We're achieving nothing. Iraq, hugely expensive. OK, Saddam's gone, but does anybody really think that Iraq's a happier, better place? No. Uh, or will be in five or ten years' time? Uh, and if, if what we're saying with Iran is we want to stop them getting nuclear weapons, frankly, there's not much we can do to stop them acquiring nuclear weapons. What we, I think what we, what, what we need to do with Iran, frankly, is we need to sit down and attempt to have a very frank conversation with them. Mm -hmm. But to think by going to war mm -hmm. that we will achieve much in Iran or stop them getting nuclear weapons, I think, is ridiculous. And, and personally, I'm extremely tired um, of the United Kingdom joining in some of these overseas ventures when we never really think what the end, ga end game is going to be. Going to be, yeah, it's a great point. And I do want to talk about regulation for a moment because regulation is one of the things that we've spoken about before. Yeah. One time when I interviewed you, you were coming from a non wine party for, <laughs> yeah. for a wine that couldn't call itself wine <laughs> yeah. because of EU That's regulations. Right. In the US, we have, for example, Obamacare that was supposed to help everybody get insurance. Now we're seeing reports from major restaurant chains, for example, that they're trying out shifting people to part time workers to see if that would defray the costs of complying with Obamacare. How do you set up regulations that set rules in a free market, but that don't go so far as to create unintended consequences for businesses, workers, taxpayers even with Well, I think, this, I think in the end, this comes down to what your basic assumption is. You know, the basic assumption of the people that I do battle with in Brussels is that the state 
is the best means through which mm -hmm. we can actually get the marketplace to be successful um, and get the relationship between employer and employee to be right. The state must regulate, the state must legislate, um, and, and the state gets it right. That's their philosophy. My philosophy is completely different. My philosophy is we should get the state out of business mm -hmm. and out of people's lives as much as possible with, albeit, some sensible basic human protections for people so that they're not exploited and not abused. And, and it really is, which side of that fence do you come from? Do you believe the state can do this stuff or do you believe that free enterprise and wealth are created by individuals who've, right. got, the, who've got the state freed from them? Um, and right at the minute, um, the statists are in control everywhere. They're in control in Westminster, they're in control in Brussels, um, and they're in control here in Washington, yeah. where Washington is building up a bigger and bigger state yeah. at the expense of the constituent parts of the USA. Yes. So, so there are some similarities. It, there are many similarities, and a message like yours continues to grow and grow in popularity. So I really appreciate you being here on this show and Thank sharing you. it with us. Thank you. Nigel Farage, he's the UKIP leader and a member of European Parliament.